And after a week's hiatus, we're back live on the Revelation study, but Terry filled in admirably. And a matter of fact, Terry gets more hits on her Bible study than uh, ours does. So I told Terry I was going to turn it loose to her so she's over there. Hey, you got to take, you got to be able to take compliments with criticism. That's easy. But anyway, we're glad Terry filled in while I <clears throat> take my journeys. But uh, back to our lesson three and a continuing study of the churches of Revelation. Today we're going to move into chapter two, read the first seven verses in just a few minutes after we open with prayer. And this is uh, losing our first love, the, lo the note to, or excuse me, the letter to the first church at Ephesus. Uh, it's pretty a powerful one. And for those people that are listening who were at Davis about two months ago, they heard this in a long drawn out Exaggeration sermon, I guess, the really lesson. But this one's a little shorter, compact time, but they will pick up on some of those things and certainly will open with a prayer. Father, we just thank you for it, the opportunity to be in your house. Certainly, as we are continuing to celebrate Thanksgiving this weekend, we certainly thank you for all the blessings. It's beautiful to look around and see all the decorations in the church, inside and out. We're thankful for all those who took time out to help and blood, sweat, and tears, putting those things up. Lord, we thank you for all your blessings. We ask that everything we would say today would glorify you. Maybe somebody would draw to know you closer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we said, the book Revelation, written by John on the island of Patmos, written around 95 AD. Uh, really, if you were a, if this was a long expositional study of this, we would certainly be talking about part two of the study. Because the book of Revelation is, is divided into three sections. Chapter 1 constitutes what Jesus, when writing to John, says, the things which you have seen. Because chapter 1 was all that John saw that day sitting on the island of the Patmos. Chapter 4 picks up with, make sure I'm telling you right here. Yeah. Picks up with the things which are to come, which is the future references. But chapter 2 and 3, Second section is the things which are. And as I said, these are the seven lessons written, 11 stories, letters written to the seven churches in um, Asia Minor at, at the time. And the things that he writes about are the messages. As I said, these are seven letters written to seven different churches. As I said, each one of these individual lesson, letters were addressed to one of the churches. However, all seven churches got it. So if you were in one church, you kind of understood what was going on in the other church. But one of the things before I read is there's three different perspectives on the letters, and you got to keep those in mind as you go through it. Number one is these letters got to be understood in their primary association. These are real letters written to seven literal churches in the Asia Minor, which is Turkey area today, written, as I said, around the end of the first century. So they're written to seven churches that had problems. One of them don't have anything negative to say, two of them don't have anything negative to say about them, but certainly uh, written to those churches to address issues there. Second of all, they need to be understood in their personal application because it said the word of God is written, so it is written throughout all time. Certainly it's written to Christians over the years that have the same characteristics. Uh, we all will find out as you go through it, we know somebody or a church specifically today that is an Ephesian church or hopefully not a Sardis church. Hopefully maybe a Philadelphian church. But all the, you know, the, all the characteristics of believers are listed in these seven sections. And then the third way we look at it is in the prophetic anticipation. Each one of these churches represents a certain time period in the church age. For example, the Ephesus church was the first church would be a representative of the apostolic church that was in existence from the day the church was born at Pentecost. And then the next church age would be the, uh, the Smyrnian church, which certainly would be a chronological time church through the years that was very persecuted and on and on, which means if you want to understand the church in the last days, it's the Laodicean church. So we just given as this background as this understanding as we go through it. One of the other things that we talk about to these churches is that all of these churches, there are some similarities in the letters. They all begin with, I know your works. 
So it, Jesus, as he begins to di diagnose the church, is, is like a doctor when you go to him. He begins to diagnose what's going on in the church. We said through those eyes of fire when we gave that illustration of him a couple weeks ago. So each one of them, he commends them for their works. Each of them has a promise at the end to him who overcomes. Uh, and then each one has a message tailor needed to that church also to individual believers throughout the ages. And then each one of them has the, you know, if they have a diagnosis, we've got to have something to be able to overcome it. And how, what, what do we do with it? So all of those are going to have that. And certainly we'll talk about, we're going to talk about that. One of the other things is I made a mention um, a couple weeks ago when we gave that description of the Lord is each one of those characteristics of the Lord are tailor-made for each one of the church. Uh, the Lord with the eyes of fire is sort of seeking and looking into the churches and the individuals to see who they really are, the problems they are, and then they diagnose us to do it. So uh, problems that are really faced by a lot of modern churches today can be overcome really not by hiring outsiders, but just really going to the book of Revelation and find out the Lord's uh, references to these different churches. Well, first of all, let's read to the first church because we're going to spend the next several weeks and months over doing that. So first of all, we're going to talk at the first church. The loveless church was the church at Ephesus. So let's read. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write. Remember, John is writing this down. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And that's the word of God for the people of God. And certainly may God bless the reading and the exposition of the word. The first thing we look at as we've now seen this letter that was written to the church at Ephesus is who the destination of the letter was. It's addressed to the angel or the messenger of the church at Ephesus. Probably a reference to the pastor of the church, obviously he's the leader of the church. Certainly um, there's some, I mean, when we went through it, there was some discrepancy. Was it the actual angel who represented the church or was it to the pastor? It don't make a difference to us today, I don't think. But people like to argue about everything. You know how, as you said, over and say something, somebody's going to go with it. But anyway, this was written to the church in the city of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was the most prominent city in this area at this time. It was a very cosmopolitan commercial center for the area. Uh, it was also a religious ceremony place here. Uh, it was a cultural, very rich, um, and there was a group of you know more highly influential people there. But there was also a little area that was known where the, the poorer area lived. So it was, uh, you know, it was that area that was kind of mixed. Uh, it was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Anybody have any idea what that would be? The Temple of Diana. Now think about it. We're back uh, less than 100 years from you know, in A.D. They had a temple there that set some seat 24,000 people. Now you think about that. I mean, we have football stadium, you know, smaller schools, Division II schools, probably maybe have uh, less than that. Uh, but that's a, still a large stadium of people that were having, was this temple of Diana. Now, Diana was, and I like the notes back, was that she was the, um, the patron saint of Ephesus, was this name Artemis Ephesian. There's where it gets his name from, which was a local deity based on the Greek goddess Diana. You know, or the other name was Artemis, if you recognize those from your history. Um, she's mentioned about five times in the book of Acts, if you read through that. And Paul caused an uproar because one of the things that happened, how they made money, was they'd make these little statues of Diana and sell them. You know, people make money all the time. And when Paul come in and said, you're not going to have any other gods other than God, and many of the people that became believers quit buying them, and her own pocketbook, and of course a riot broke out. If you remember that from your study 
in Ephesus in the Acts. But this was the area. Now the temple was a very was a center of immorality because she was a sex goddess that was there, and you can just kind of imagine what was going on in that area. But there's also a couple other things that was important in the city. It was a bank. It's one of the early banks in the history. So they had a banking industry there. So when Jordan got a paycheck, she would go stick it in the bank and hopefully make a little money off of it there. I don't know if they made any more uh, interest today at the end than they did today. But anyway, it was a banking industry that was set there. And for those that are art buffs, it was a great area for art galleries. So as you said, it was a cosmopolitan area and a lot of money was flowing through the city. Now, Paul established a church there. Obviously, you know what the church's name was. It was Ephesus on his second missionary journey in the book of Acts. He would later go back there and spend three years ago. When I tell you the three pastors in recorded history who were there, you want to say, man, as Dr. Jeremiah said, if you ever had to want to be a member of a church, this was a church to be a member of. It was set there, established by Paul, which obviously taught there a few years. So Paul was one of the leading pastors at the church. Well, later on, he would establish that one of his protégés would be a teacher there who went by the name of Timothy. So, I mean, you talk about two teachers. How would you like to have standing up here the Apostle Paul teaching? And then next week, we'll have Timothy up here teaching. But we're not through yet. There's one more person who was a teacher there, none other than John himself. So you talk about having some powerhouse preachers coming there that were teachers there. Paul, Timothy, and John were there. Matter of fact, most likely Paul I and mean, John was still teaching and living in Ephesus when he was captured and taken to the island of Patmos for teaching the gospel. So a very cosmopolitan area, a teach, uh, but a very discerning church that was well adept in the doctrine. And we're going to find out they are something that the Lord very much commends. And when you find out who the teachers were, you certainly who they were. Well, as I said, when the Lord began to deliver his message to each of his churches, he would focus on one aspect of his own character as we read back in chapter one. Remember, he had the white hair, the eyes of fire, the feet, the sword, and all that. And so here he's going to begin to introduce himself is that he is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And we remember that the golden lampstands were the seven churches. So Jesus is saying, I have the churches and this church in my hand. So no matter what your problems are, hey, you're in my right hand. I have the power to meet your needs. And I said that was why it was important to remember his description because they were tailor-made to each of these. And so he's sufficient. So he begins by addressing them as him who holds the seven churches. Now, as when you go to the doctor and you have a problem, let's go find out the diagnosis of what was going on in this church. So at every one of these churches, there's some good news, it seems like, except for one we'll get to near the end, who has nothing good to say about it. But the good news of, about this church is uh, probably more good about it than anything else. It takes up most of the words that Jesus writes to him. He has five positive things to say about him and only one negative. So I mean, if you're grading papers, hey, that's good. Five negative, five positive, one negative. You're probably going to pass, I guess. Well, the first thing he begins to talk about, he says, you are a dynamic, it was a dynamic church. It was a very busy, working, dynamic congregation, and they were busy doing the work of the Lord. And of course, you know, the commentaries are begin to say, you know, we often de-emphasize the importance of the works that we do because we don't want to, you know, mess people up by saying, hey, you can earn your way to salvation. It's not by grace, but certainly uh, grace is the only way to be saved, but after grace, we shouldn't experience some kind of works. And this church was full of works. Uh, of course, the commentary says anytime, whenever you find a clear message of grace being preached, you also find a working church. So a church that preaches grace and faith in the Lord through grace usually will have a church that is really working and abounded in works. And this church was full of that. Uh, scripture tells us over in Acts 19 that the word of God was spreading throughout the Asia Minor area as a result of the gospel being preached in Ephesus. No wonder if you got Paul standing up here and Timothy and John, they were prophets. You talk about, you know, setting fire today, it'd be like, I don't know, Franklin Graham coming and maybe Charles Stanley and uh, John Hagee, you know, these big names, T.D. Jakes, big name speakers that would come up here and speak. 
It would probably get people motivated and get the truth out. So it was a church that had great teachers. But Jesus said, hey, you are a working church. They were continuing to get the word out. And it was a dynamic place and the Lord commends them for it. Also, he said it was a very dedicated church. And he uses two words, works and labor, in the scripture here, verse 2. The word labor means these people were not only just going about doing things for the Lord, but they were really working themselves to the point of exhaustion. Uh, they were kind of, not kind of, they were actually paying the price to serve the Lord. Almost a hint of weariness that the Lord recognizes in them is they were exhausted from the labor they were doing for the Lord. And the commentary says, you know, I often see that in churches there are lay people, and I think all of us are here, I don't know any other professional ministers around here, who will go to work and spend 40 hours a week at work, at home, doing things in their house, and then coming to church and doing the work of the Lord. Putting up the greenery, fixing the outside, cleaning and vacuuming, and, and doing the work of the, of the Lord. And of course, unfortunately, as the comment, there are always too few people in the body that do the work and the majority does. What does that say? 80%, 20% always do 80% of the work in the church. And some of us here could say amen to that. But anyway, we understand that's the way the church was in Ephesus. They were wearing themselves out, working and doing the things. The church and the Lord commends them of that. Now King David had something to say about that in one of his um, lessons, if we go back in our mind to uh, 2 Samuel, when he was, they were going, he was going to buy that uh, altar, set up, or set up that land to set up an altar. And the man said, I'll give it to you. You're the king. And David said, uh-uh. His quote was, I won't offer any burnt offerings to the Lord that don't cost me anything. It comes from 2 Samuel. So with the staff and the people at this church, they were really wearing themselves out doing the work of the Lord. And the Lord commends them for it. So we can see we compare it to ourselves as Christians today, as a church as a whole. Are we a church that is dynamic, doing the work of the Lord? Are we most people doing enough that really wears yourself out when you is doing the extra, going the extra mile when you know you worked all day and you come home and tired, we've got to go up and do a few things. And of course, the not that we like reading those things, and by the way, I turned in that PPR report this week. <laughs> and I got a thumbs up from the preacher for it. But, you know, the, Dr. Jeremiah says, the Ephesian congregation was a dynamic and its annual report must have looked good. You know, I'm going to turn those things in, but most people, I don't care about that. But, you know, the people in authority like reading them. It would have never matched this report that he said I saw recently. Here was the annual report that somebody turned in. New members, none. Baptisms, none. Gifts to missions, none. And then at the bottom of the report, the church clerk had written, Brethren, pray for us that we might be faithful until the end. <laughs> so, I mean, wait, wait, this church would not have had that. This church would have been dynamic. It would have had a huge report and just would have been busted at the scene. And any uh, pastor would have loved to have been a member of, it, of this church. So Jesus says, hey, you're a dynamic church. You're dedicated. Also, it was very determined. And then we see the second word, patience, that picks up again later on, in which they were not only working themselves to tiredness, but they were patience in the things that they were doing. Um, they were getting fierce opposition from the area because obviously they were teaching the truth that you know, there's only one God and running into a lot of problems facing persecution from the members in the area because, hey, you're not supposed to be you know, worshiping Artemis. She's not really God. She's the one true God, of course, would run into problems with that. And of course, in Acts 19, we saw, we saw that opposition encouraged when they, they had the riot break up and poor Paul was really taken out behind the woodshed for his truth. So Jesus says, hey, you're a very dynamic, dedicated, and determined church. But also, he said, i got to tell you a couple other things. But you're very disciplined. The church of Ephesus could not bear, he says, those who are evil. They wouldn't tolerate evil practiced in their church. They wouldn't tolerate somebody coming up here and, and beginning to preach, oh, well, the Bible's half true. Uh, they wouldn't, or, you know, many of the things that are controversial today that are outside the Bible, they would take them by the collar and leave them out the door. They were very dedicated. It would not allow false doctrines to come into the church. They were, you know, they were very depth in what the commentary calls church discipline. They wouldn't tolerate evil and frustrations in that city. And they were very patient and disciplined in it. And they were what 
Terry's favorite guy, Charles Spurgeon, said that we should pray to God to send us a few men with what the Americans call grit in them, who when they know a thing to be right, won't turn away or turn aside or step. Men who will persevere all the more because of the difficulties they meet or foes to encounter, who stand all the more true to the master when they're opposed, who the more they thrust into the fire, the hotter they become who just like the bow, the further the string is drawn, the more powerfully it sends forth its arrow, and so the more they are trodden upon, the more mighty they will become in the case of truth against error. Stand in firm. This church would have not allowed anybody to come in here and bring in false doctrine. And certainly they were, the Lord certainly blesses them for that. The last thing that he tells them was they were also discerning. Uh, they fought hard to keep the doctrine pure as I said, one of the things that they did was they put two things out that was causing problems. One was this thing that was called apostolic succession. There was people who were coming in, because remember most of the apostles had died off except for John and Paul, and these people would come in and say, I need to come in and teach because I have, one of the apostles laid hands on me and I have been given the authority to teach and they would get up and teach and this church says, ah, we don't believe in that, that's not biblical and they would cast them out and then they wouldn't tolerate this thing called something by the Nicolaitans now you get two different points of view on this there are some who believe that the Nicolaitans were teaching there was a difference between the clergy and the laity you know the black robe white collar people that stand up here and teach and then the rest of us who sit out here that they are a little more holier than we are and they've been given a special you know and all this and of course, we know that, as they said, the only difference between the man who stands up and preaches and us sits out, he gets paid for it, we know, right? We're all members of the same when it comes to teaching the truth. God has called us all to many different causes. These guys were teaching there was a difference between the clergy and the laity. And then there are some who believe that the teaching of the Nicolaitans was a, one of God named Nicholas of Antioch who came in and was promoting impure and immoral lifestyles for believers. Once again, I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference. They didn't tolerate it. They said, we're not going to allow it in the church. So that's all the good things that the Lord has said. This is a great, if you're, this would be a great church to be a member of. However, you know, when you stand up and your boss calls you in or the teacher calls you in and says, Roger, this was a great paper. Your grammar was right. Your syntax was right. Your, you know, the theme follows. But red and then all of a sudden you see, you see the red ink at the bottom. You remember getting those papers? Uh, Terry shaking her head over there. But you knew the bad stuff with him. Jesus said, however I have this against you. Here is the problem. He said they have left the first love. So externally they were commendable in every way but remember those eyes of the Lord pierced past it and they found there was something lacking. They had left the first love. Now what are we talking about the first love? That excitement and that devotion that believers experience when they're first born. You know, when people you know come to faith in Christ, they just can't wait to get and sing and be in church every time the doors open or everything that something can happen and going out and telling people and reading the Bible and praying and doing all these things. That was the excitement. I love the commentary he said is getting over the honeymoon and allowing Christianity to become a religion instead of a relationship. And Jesus said, hey, you got so caught up in doing the work, you forgot who we're supposed to be. And that song that Michael W. Smith sings now, I'm going back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. I think we sing it once. It's all about you, Jesus. That's sort of what he's talking about here. They had the fault. They, had, they didn't love Jesus the way they did when they first became believers. And as a result, they didn't love one another the same way they did when he first started. So that's the problem with the church. As I said, these diagnoses can relate to modern churches, churches through the ages, individuals through the ages, all those people. We all know people who were on fire and all of a sudden they cooled off. I might go to church once a month, maybe once a year now. Certainly the, the love of the Lord has left the fire. And of course the commentary also says, oh by the way guys, uh, if you've fallen in in bad in relationship with your spouse or your significant other. The diagnosis that the Lord has here can work in relationships too, you know. No longer have that hot honeymoon love that you had when you first met. What is the diagnosis? So, we've got the commendation. We've got the problem. 
So just like when you go to the doctor and he said, well, your blood pressure is a little high, your cholesterol is a little high, or whatever else you got. All right? What, what's the, how do I get past it? Well, the Lord begins to give the diagnosis with, with three different demands that will help. <clears throat> and it's the three R's. Remember, repent, and repeat. Restoration, he says, begins by remembering. Meditating on what the relationship was like when you first met. What was it like? I read the Bible more. You know, I was jumped up and I helped Julie play the piano and sing in the choir. I was all excited and all these things. And I want to sing Acapulco and all that stuff up there. <laughs> you know, you know all, I wanted to sing. Man, I got kind of tired of doing that. You know, we remember the way it was when we first started. Remember what it was like to sing and praise and witness and do all the things that uh, the Lord had called us to do. And that's why he said, you know, in your, even your relationships, you know, was it Dr. Jeremiah says, for, for guys, if you haven't taken your wife out to dinner, take her out once in a while, buy her some candy and some flowers, have her a, uh, one of those defibrillators after a while, she might pass out from being in shock. But hey, remember what it was like. And then he says, repent. Change your mind. Go, quit going in the direction you were and go back to the direction you came from. If you left your first love, turn back and head back to the way it was before. And then, Repeat. Do those things that you did. Get up here and get your thing and start singing and helping and whatever whatever you were doing before. Go back and do it again. The commentary says, feelings follow actions, not vice versa. I don't feel like doing it. I don't feel like getting up going to church. I'm too tired. Get up and go and also the feelings will come with you. Now listen, it says, where the body goes, the heart will follow. So Jesus is saying, remember the way it was Turn around and go back and start doing the things you did before and the emotions will come back. Well, he says, but if you don't, one of the more saddest statements in the Bible, he says, um, but unless you repent, I will come and I will remove your lampstand from its place. He said, if you don't do it, I will take the lamp out. With the lamp's the light, the light of the influence of the church, and then you will ultimately just be going through the motions and become a dead church or a dead Christian, just going through the motions. No, no life, no fun when the light is removed. Dr. Jeremiah said, I flew, he flew to London, and he said, I went to those couple of the cathedrals where Spurgeon used to teach. He said, they were filled with thousands of people during Spurgeon's time, but they had lost the first love, the lampstand return. He said in a, in a cathedral, it used to have three to 5,000 people, but it was less than 20 to 30 people there. And he said how sad it was to see what happened. That Jesus said, if you don't repent, return and go back to the ways, I will remove my lampstand and then you will lose your, lose your influence, not only in your life, but in the community. But the good thing, he says, but if you repent, return and repeat, you will be, he says, and you're an overcomer, and we're finding out the overcomer are those who hold out to the end. I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise God, your eternal home in heaven with me forever in the new heaven, in the new earth that's to come in the future. So you see the diagnosis. This is the pipe policy. Now, next week, we're going to go talk about the church at Smyrna, not the one up the road here that we can walk to practically, but the church in the second church. In Smyrna, we're going to find that there was nothing negative said about that church. Nothing negative. All good stuff. But there were some things going on outside of that church that was really causing lots of problems. But to the great church at Ephesus who had everything right on the inside, had a little heart problem, and the Lord says, repent. Remember and repent and return, and I will let you be an overcomer, and you will move into heaven with me one day. Anybody got anything to add to it? You can see that'd be a good. That's a good sermon to teach. <laughs> Amen. Okay, let's pray. Father, we just thank you once again for letting us study your word and Lord helping us to understand your lesson to the church in Ephesus. And we realize that was the mission of the early church. And we see it's the church today that we can be so full of works and so full of the things that you've called us to do that we stop. We don't stop and remember how much that we love you and do the things because of you. May we always stop, remember, repeat, and repent and turn back to you so we can always keep the lampstand standing here in Williston 
and in our personal lives that others will see you through us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.